Hello everybody, my name is Yan Ho and I am the person behind the Wissahickon Valley Historian Blog. So thank you everyone for tuning in as I will be answering all of your questions that you all have about me as the Wissahickon Valley Historian and the blog itself. So the reason why I want to make this video is because first I want all of you to really get to know who I am uh, not only as the Wislakin Valley historian, but as myself personally. Um, and of course, I think this is a great opportunity for everyone to really you know, hear from me through this video and just you know, being curious about what, um, what I do um, through my work and maybe if you have some curious mindset of what I do outside. So I'll be happy to answer all of these types of questions um, as I will um, be introducing myself in the beginning and then gradually answering some questions that you all may have. So thank you all so much for tuning in. So let's get started. So as mentioned earlier in the video, uh, my name is Yan Ho and I am the person behind the Wissahiggin Valley Historian Blog. So a little background about myself and how I got into history. Um, I was born and raised in the state of Pennsylvania. I live near the city of Philadelphia, so I'm more of the East Coast. Um, so how I got into history, I was pretty exposed to all things historical as a young kid uh, from all the field trips that I had to given a table placement by my mom and dad that shows all the presidents in order from George Washington to George W. Bush. And it wasn't until my first year at Temple University that I was fascinated with historical architecture. Initially, I was really going all in for architecture only because I was a huge fan of Legos as a kid. I had like a whole pile of Legos at my home at the time and you know it I was like really into it until being until I was introduced to this program that I never heard of before which was the historic preservation program and that really made me consider like oh you know maybe this field might be more fascinating to look into um, so that was really the true spark and you know being I was really grateful for being part of that program because you know, being in the city of Philadelphia especially, you have the opportunity to explore the city itself. You know, there's things in Philadelphia that you may not know um, from compared to what you already knew from school. Uh, so uh, that was really how you know, my interest in history got started. So after four years at Temple University with my bachelor's degree in historic preservation, I felt the need of heading back to school after that. Um, doing only historic preservation may not be enough for me, uh, even though I have done a lot of internship opportunities within my field and just doing a lot of you know, fun research on old buildings that I have discovered around um, Philadelphia and even near my home, my hometown, uh, outside the city itself. Um, so I decided to go for library information science, which I find bizarre because I was not much of a bookworm myself. But the real motivation behind um, that, um, that field was with the research that I've done throughout years at Temple University, going to libraries and archives and other institutions that really helped me find all the information that I needed to do this research on the historical buildings that I've done throughout the program. So by going into the library information science field, I it, it's like giving back to the researchers in a way. You know, as a researcher myself, you know, I thanked all the librarians and archivists who really helped me 
find all this information for all the research that I've done on these old buildings. So by being the librarian or archivist, or maybe both, I felt that, you know, I decided to really help those future researchers out there who wanted to find all this information that they wanted. Um, so I felt like, you know, the way that the librarians and archivists did uh, to help, I felt like I want to do the same like them. You know, they're kind of helping me um, get into you know, the, this field to really like explore what they do and you know hopefully be as successful as them. So it all started in the year 2021 when I just finished my master's degree in library information science and I was searching through jobs around my hometown of Pennsylvania and even outside the state. And it wasn't until my dad found this job, job at an international school in Vietnam where he thought it would be a good opportunity for me to explore my heritage as a Vietnamese American, as well as practicing my Vietnamese language and engaging with the local Vietnamese there, here. At first, I was not too thrilled of moving to a different country, um, as I never really thought about this ever in my life, but my parents thought about it and just think that I thought at the time that this is a benefit for me, it's for my own good. I'm just thinking like, you know, this is really good for me since I haven't been to the country for a long time. The last time I went, I was like about 10 years old um, the last time I went. So Vietnam was very different for sure. So they thought it's a good opportunity for me to head back and just see how the country is. You know, pretty much we we're just experiencing it together. Until this day, we are continuing to experience how um, the country is continuing to thrive in a way. Um, so yeah, um, after um, after a few months of waiting from my workplace um, and then just making sure the paperwork is submitted, we were able to fly to Vietnam. And it took a couple of trips to get there, so we went from Philadelphia to LA, and then from LA to um, Seoul at the Incheon Air Airport, which is I consider the most beautiful airport I've ever seen. I we made a lot of stops there every time we uh, head back to the U.S. and back to Vietnam. Um, so that's a really nice airport to really um, stop by, and then finally uh, to Vietnam is the final destination. I can tell you. Um, from LA airport to uh, Korea, <clears throat> the flight is a luxury. Like hardly, I mean, even though it was COVID time uh, and not many people have, you know, full, you know, not able to fly to another country due to restrictions. But luckily for us, we were sponsored and we were able to fly over there with no problem. Um, so not many people were on the plane uh, between LA and uh, Korea and luckily for us you know, we were able to have enough space to sleep around and you know walk around the plane as much as we want um, so it felt really good it doesn't we don't feel any you know, you know you know feeling in our bodies whenever we have a long flight like that so we were very fortunate at the time that we had a good experience but when we finally get to Vietnam it's a complete different um, feeling. It's like you're in, trapped in a horror film where no one is around you but you, <laughs> in a way. Uh, <clears throat> so we arrived there pretty late. Uh, it was close to midnight and uh, hardly anyone was at the Vietnam airport in Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, there were only employees working there only to help those who are you know special you know, sponsored, those who were sponsored to enter the country. So we were one of those unfortunate ones to arrive. Uh, the people who worked there at the time, they wore those blue suits, blue jumpsuits um, that they wear to protect themselves from COVID. It's kind of scary to see them in it, but <laughs> we ended up wearing them ourselves since we 
it was required to uh, wear them during those COVID times. But you know, despite that scary experience, uh, and after uh, spending a few weeks being isolated during those times, the country was easing up from restrictions, and everyone was able to go free. And we were fortunate enough to find a place like this, is where I am right now. Um, so we are currently living in a really nice apartment, um, like looking at District 1 in the, trying to think of direction, like the south, I believe, southwest area. We're looking at the southwest view of the center city part of Vietnam, or Ho Chi Minh City. So we were able to um, look at all like the great views from the 17th floor, which is where we currently are. Um, so if you think about it, like we were kind of close. Like we were actually pretty close to Center City. Um, I like to compare it to the city of Philadelphia, to Ho Chi Minh City, because we're like um, kind of similar, like we're closer to the city. Like we can see like the well buildings from the distance, right? The tallest buildings and all that. So I like to make that comparison, just be like here to Philadelphia. So it's really cool. We get to have a good view. We see fireworks, we see sunsets, sunrises coming up. And you know, it's amazing to really get that view. And also just looking down below to see like the rush hour of people on their motorbikes. It's fun. Um, so yeah, yeah. Um, we were able to travel around uh, as much as we can, uh, especially around like during those major holidays like Lunar New Year's. In Vietnamese, we call it Tet. Um, so for those who don't know about the holiday, it's basically it's when everybody goes home, goes back to their hometowns, wherever they're from, and then being able to spend time with their families. You know, just using that long two weeks. I would say typically two weeks is how long the holiday lasts. So they spent that time to just you know, really catch up and socialize and do other things with their families. Um, so that's the typical tradition of what the Lunar New Year's is all about. Um, so we went to a couple places in Vietnam. We only go to places that we know. Uh, for example, we went back to my parents' hometown. So my dad, he was from Hue. He grew up there all his life. So we were able to visit there a few times. Uh, we were able to revisit uh, my grandparents' homes uh, that are still standing to this day, which we feel really proud of. Um, and then just, of course, visiting the iconic Imperial City, uh, Imperial Palace of the, the kings of the Nguyen Dynasty. Um, so it was really cool just to revisit there again, just bringing back memories, of course, of the last time we went in the area. Um, and then my mom, meanwhile, she's from the deep south of Vietnam, near the Mekong Delta uh, in Ban Chan. Uh, Ban Chan is not as well known as other places around South Vietnam, but um, it's it's a very small area, for sure. Uh, my mom grew up there. We were able to visit um, a relative there who um, you know, has been living there all his life, um, so we were able to catch up and to see where how they're doing. Uh, that's pretty much all we do. We just visit some family members and just catch up uh, in Hue and Ban Chan. But um, when we have our own free time, we are able to visit other places in Vietnam we've never been to before. Um, so this place called Vung Tao. Uh, Vung Tao is uh, three hours away from Ho Chi Minh City up north. Um, and it's so beautiful. Um, I mean, the food is great up there. I get to visit some places that um, are like more really well known to the area. Uh, there's a statue of Jesus there, which I really am impressed to see every time I like we drive by at night. It's amazing. I went there during Christmas time last year, 2022, and it was really beautiful. And the Christmas lights in Vung Tao is amazing. They did a really good job doing all these Christmas decorations and have that Christmas feeling. So I, I really enjoyed that. Um, I mean, we, we went to Da Lat before. Uh, we went there a few times when I was a kid. Um, I didn't remember much since I was very young. 
but we, we recently went there um, to just, you know, do some, like, <laughs> you know, relaxing, just looking at some views, and visiting places, of course. Um, I We went there when my sisters visited me here. Uh, we went to the crazy house in Ballad. It was really bizarre with the architecture. I mean, I, as much as I'm impressed, uh, it was just, yeah, not my style. It's like the place is kind of abstract, but it's cool. Well, I mean, everybody visits there, so that's really all worth it. Um, but yeah, I mean, so far we only visited like places that we know. Uh, we also visited um, Gamran. Gamran is a further up north, I think past Rungtao, uh, near Nyajag, uh, like another beach resort. So we went around the beach resort. Um, the Gamran area. So, so we were introduced that by a group of people that we met last year who were very fortunate to show us around. Um, there they have like this ancient, um, what do you call it, these ancient temples that were built when like Vietnam and Cambodia um, had like a, like a bond at the time, in, like the 1400s I believe. But it's really cool just to see like these buildings are still standing um, like you get to really see the piece of history that I didn't really know about in Vietnam, so it's really cool. Uh, besides, you know, the Imperial Palace in Hue, I get to learn about the, you know, the buildings that were um, have like a special connection with Cambodia, so it's really cool. Um, but yeah, I think so far we only visited around the central southern part of Vietnam, so something places that we are very used to, we just were comfortable going. Um, but yeah, um, we're hoping that someday in the future we can, you know, keep visiting those more places that we've never been to. Um, so next I can share um, my daily routine, uh, like how I, um, how I spend my day uh, during the weeks and of course weekends. Um, so typically I wake up around 4 or 5 a.m. I'm crazy, I know. But the reason why I wake up so early is because I work in a school library at my international school, which is called the Pennsylvania International American School. In short, we call it Penn School. And it's not because, that's not the reason why I was hired there, because I'm from Pennsylvania. I just find it a coincidence. <laughs> but anyways, um, the reason why I wake up so early is because my library in the school is the biggest space out of every room in the school. So I have a lot more responsibility to take care of it compared to everyone else who are, you know, dealing with their own space. So I had to wake up early just to be everyone. Um, so every, before all the teachers and students arrive, so that <laughs> I can get that done fast. Um, so after waking up around that time, I make sure to eat breakfast. Uh, typically I would eat uh, leftovers or uh, instant noodles that were bought um, at, a, at a supermarket. Uh, sometimes I even make my own breakfast whenever available. Um, I like to eat you know, eggs with bread. It's like my top breakfast out there. It just fills you up. Um, and then just after that, I get ready, get changed. Um, so I can tell you a little bit about how the attire, what we have to wear in school. So. Since my school is a private school, um, uniform is required. So I am considered a foreigner. So as a foreigner, um, so for men, for example, they have to wear a white shirt, black pants, and a blue tie, just to show the color code of the school. Um, but for the women, so we have, we are also required to wear a white shirt and a black pants, or we can wear a um, a black skirt, uh, just as long as we follow the requirements of, of the you know, school policy. But for the Vietnamese teachers, they are required to wear a specific type of dress and a specific, specific color to represent the school uh, or even the school company as well. Um, so they have more um, like limited options compared to the expat teachers, we call our, we, they, we were called expats um, from the school just to, I don't know, 
I don't know, I don't know why they call it expats. I just like foreigner is a more better term to use. Um, but the, the Vietnamese teachers, they have limited options to wear it unless, you know, they are new teachers in the year, so they have to wear white shirt, black pants. So still that same requirement. But luckily for me, as a Vietnamese American, you know, someone as an American citizen, but also with Vietnamese heritage, I had the flexibility of wearing both the white shirt and black pants, as well as, you know, blending in with the Vietnamese teachers with the specific um, dress uh, style and you know, clothing that they have to wear every day. So I like to be included and, you know, I like to be part of the culture around my school. So, I mean, they also like it too, obviously, because you know, <laughs> I just feel like I feel bad that they have to wear that every day. So I'm like, hey, why not? Why not join them? So, yeah. Um, so that's the uniform. Okay. Uh, so how I get to work? Very easy. So, I mean, from my work apartment to my workplace, it's not that far at all. I mean, I should be able to walk, but um, I felt that it's easier to go to work by my electric bike. I do not have a motorbike. I am not ready to drive those yet, as I am experimenting myself, trying to balance myself on a heavy motorbike, like my dad's Vespa. Um, it's not that easy for me. Like I, I can, I'm not that, not, not strong enough to handle a motorbike yet. But as of right now, I'm using my electric bike that my dad was able to find um, online and just use it to go to work. Um, using my electric bike is actually really, really fun and easy to use. Um, I, mean, I bring it up like twice a week to my apartment to charge it, uh, just keep it safe from anything else. Um, but yeah, I mean, I use my bike um, just for a couple like miles away from my place, like maybe five, ten minutes. That's pretty much how far I can go with my bike because I'm afraid that it'll die if I don't charge it the next day. Um, but, you know, I'm careful with how I use, how much I use the bike. Um, so I haven't tried going out further um, away from my apartment, but I mean, who knows? But I, I don't really travel much anyway. I'm, I'm more of an introvert, I would say. I'm just enjoying the indoors. <laughs> I, but yeah. Anyways, uh, continuing my daily routine. Um, so after parking my bike, I walk into the school. Typically, I would see uh, the cleaning ladies, a few of them, um, just cleaning around the school, making sure everything's all ready for the students and teachers to come in. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, for me, when I walk in, um, so my library is basically a, like a house. Uh, in Asian, Asian cultures, we have to take off our shoes whenever we enter inside a home. Uh, so that's what the library is like. So I have to take off my shoes before entering and just you know, do my daily routine from there with my shoes off. Uh, yeah, something that not every foreign teacher is used to, but you know, it's just how it is. So when I walk in the library, um, I turn on my computer, make sure everything's plugged in, everything's all clean around my desk, and then I also look around my library, making sure that all the books are back in the place, back in the right shelves, uh, nothing on the floor, I make sure all the books are standing, of course, and on display that I have on top of the shelves, and then I look at my book cart. Uh, <clears throat> so the book cart is something that um, the school did not uh, provide for me, so my dad and I have to find a place locally around uh, the area to find someone who's able to make a book cart for me. So we were very fortunate, and we have it uh, right there in the library. Um, for anyone who doesn't know where the book goes, just put it right there. So I look at the book cart, I just take a look at what some books that were dropped off at my at there, so, <clears throat> so I use that to just go around and put the books back. So I like to imagine that like I'm in a store, 
mean, I've worked in a store for five years back home in PA. Um, it's a really fun experience, too. So I like to, it's a good reminder of myself. You know, just like, oh, yeah, I've dealt with, uh, you know, recovering the store and just making sure everything looks good before everyone arrives. So I kind of have that same feeling whenever I walk in the library. It's like, I want to make sure that the library looks clean and neat um, you know, before all the kids and teachers arrive. You know, I, it just, you know, it's what it is, right? Um, but I, I mean, normally libraries don't not supposed to be like that, but um, I would love to explain further how it is, but I, I think uh, I'm going to start bla blabbering um, about, like, how it is, but uh, I'm more into, like, how my daily routine is, so I will continue that. <laughs> so... After all the recovery that I've done in the library, um, I was required to turn on some music. <laughs> so I plug in the speaker and, um, and then just turn on some really positive music for the young kids to listen to you know, when they come in. Uh, so that's something that I do. Um, of course, I just sit around my desk, make sure I get my, you know, some paperwork started or catching up on it. And then while waiting for the students, of course. I have students come into the library um, during their break times and free times, which is really nice. You know, I get to see like who comes to the library a lot, and, you know, who's the typical customer, I would say, or the, in library terms, who's the typical patron, right? It's because it's easier to recognize faces, you get to know their names, who they are, and all that. You know, they, you get friendlier with them every time you see them. So I see students every morning, you know, uh, just saying good morning and all that stuff. Um, so, yeah, I mean, when class is in session, um, the, the library is very quiet. Um, sometimes um, the library would have meetings. The library is even used as a photo shoot or video shoot, and I can tell you why. Because um, the library is the most beautiful space out of all the spaces available in school. And, you know, we have better lighting and, like, can view, I guess. Um, but yeah, I mean, the library is like a multi-purpose room, I would say. Um, I'm just witnessing everything that's happening in there that's not typically used as a normal library, but it's whatever the school like to use it. So I just comply with it and just go with it. Um, and I just, you know, keep going with my daily routine um, as long as I'm, nothing's interfering with my work. So, um, yeah, uh, I mean, I can, in another, next time in the video, I can explain, like, my library work in detail, if you like, but, um, I would say that's basically my daily routine, um, of working at a library at an international school. Um, so, lunchtime, I usually go there around, like, 10, 40. That's, like, the earliest time anyone can go to lunch. Um, that's, like, right there on the dots because every food is ready uh, so I just you know grab some food eat and then just you know head back down so I made sure to eat early as possible before all the you know, rush amount of kids start you know coming in line and get some food I made sure to beat that so I've been doing a good job so far um, uh, yeah I think uh, that's it for the daily routine I mean my work time is from 7.30 to 4.30, but as a weirdo like me, it's like 6 a.m. to 4.30, so it's like a 10-hour uh, shift for me, so hey, we're paid. <laughs> so, yeah, that's basically my typical life. Um, in the, this part of the video, I can definitely say, like, um, some differences with <clears throat> the Vietnamese culture and environment compared to the U.S., um, so Obviously, everybody knows in Vietnam, we ride the motorbikes, um, and whenever it's like 6 o'clock at night, 6 or 7, between there, it's rush hour. People are trying to get home, and everyone's stuck in traffic, and not many people are patient on the road. So around there, like people will just go on the sidewalk, try to bypass it, but unfortunately, you can't really do that. One, you're not supposed to drive on the sidewalk, and two, there's no point since 
people are already stopping at the stoplight. So people are in no people are not patient on the road. So with my dad is aware of of that. Um, so you have to be careful, especially on the motor bike. You never know what comes at behind you or what's in front of you. People are not many people are careful on the road. Um, but you know, just keep a full eye. And just you know, I guess go with the flow. Whatever you feel that is comfortable. Whenever you're riding a motorbike. The weather here, in terms of weather, I've been wearing shorts. <laughs> I've been wearing short sleeves and shorts. You know, whenever I'm home, because you know it's a it's a warm day. Every day here, um, but uh, there, I would say like there are like three seasons in Vietnam. So right now, we are in the monsoon season. So the monsoon season it takes place um, in the fall time, like from I believe September up to November, around there. Um, so it's mostly rainy season. A lot of rain and floods may happen, but it's only up in the northern and central part of Vietnam where there's a lot of it. Um, so we, it's not a good time. Not a really a good time to um, visit those places during the monsoon season. So I would wait until like after November, so we get that all cleared up. Um, and then there's a spring and summer season. Summer seasons are hot. That's why I leave the country in the summertime because it's just so hot I can't even handle it. But uh, who knows? <laughs> Someday I decided to try it out in the summer and just stay and see how it goes. But anyways, um, but there's times uh, from December to maybe March, the weather is kind of cool depending where you are. If you're in central Vietnam like Hue, it's pretty pretty. Um, cool. It's pretty cool up there, so you have to make sure you bring a sweatshirt around that area uh, because you never know the weather. It's unpredictable. The weather is unpredictable in general. Sometimes they say it's raining, but next, like you don't see any rain. You, like you just see some sprinkles for like thirty seconds. That's it. Um, but you know, Vietnam's unpredictable, <laughs> but in an interesting way, I would say. Um, Food. I'm sure everybody's wondering about the food here in Vietnam. Well, it depends. Uh, everywhere you drive around Vietnam, there's a lot of local places. And, I mean, as a new person, if you're new in Vietnam, it'll be difficult to figure out you know, which place is the best. And uh, it's something that my parents and I had been figuring that out when we first arrived. We were trying to figure out which places are really good to eat. like. Um, we were trying to find the best Chinese restaurant in the area, and at first we asked locals, you know, I was like, hey, is there any Chinese restaurants that you know that are good? And we did try out some places, and, you know, it turns out they're okay, not as great as the Chinese restaurants that we like back home in PA, um, but luckily, um, during 2022, um, I remember a friend of mine at my workplace um, a while back, she recommended me a place in the District 5 area in Vietnam, where it's like mostly all the Chinese places um, are located. And there's a restaurant there that almost resembles one restaurant that closed a long time ago in Philadelphia. Because that one particular dish I love. And, you know, after giving it a shot, after giving it a try, we, my parents and I were, were impressed. We love that restaurant ever since. Like it's, so you know, it, it resembles some some similarities, but you know, it, it's in its own unique way. Like I'm not I try not to expect too much from all these places that we visited, but at least it shows like a Vietnamese flair, something that we really enjoy. Um, so, yeah, we found a really good Chinese restaurant there. Um, I mean, we found really a couple of good places um, around the area, and then like Bumba Hue. Bumba Hue is a real a real favorite in Vietnam in general. Like anyone in Vietnam can tell you how much they love food from Hue, and my dad is very lucky to be from there. 
Um, and we found Boomba Hoi Place in like further outside of Ho Chi Minh City. And it's really good. Really, really good. It's, it felt authentic. It tastes authentic. Um, I mean, it's a small, it's a small place, um, but um, it, it was fantastic. And every time you eat there, it's like incredible. It's not too heavy. It's like a perfectly um, balanced meal. So definitely helps you fill up. Um, but yeah, I mean, we were able to explore a lot. Um, but we're like the type of people that like to like find fast food places, fast food chains. We are huge KFC fans. The KFC here, let me tell you that. The KFC in Vietnam, I say, amazing. It's amazing. I mean, it's not as greasy as the KFCs in the United States, but the food is fantastic. I mean, every time we go to a mall, we found good malls in Vietnam too. We always go to KFC. Always the first stop. Whenever we go to the mall, like we have to make sure we eat before we shop. Um, so KFC has been our really top favorites. They really impressed us with like their quality meals. So, <laughs> um, but hey, I'm gonna stop gloating about KFC. But yeah, I mean it's a lot of surprises um, that we never expected in Vietnam. Like we we just we became like really open to anything out there. But at the same time, we're very careful. Um, we knew how much you know, Vietnam has been like modernizing itself, but there's some things in Vietnam that we were very cautious about. If I can give one advice to um, any foreigner who wants to visit Vietnam, it's really important to show your appreciation for the country. You know, I wouldn't focus too much on the history of the country something not many people want to talk about um, but it's good to show appreciation like you love Vietnam so much don't try to you know reflect back in the past just you know move forward in the future that's what you know Vietnam is pretty much going into um, but also you know if you really want to travel to a different country in general and I think for me it's important to really practice the language you know a lot of people, especially here in Vietnam, they would love to hear you talk in Vietnamese. They love to, to hear you try. I mean, yes, they will laugh at you, but in a good way. Um, in a good way. So, like, this is that way they know, like, oh, like, I mean, you're really trying. Like, that's, um, you know, just something to keep in mind because, like, just because they laugh at you doesn't mean that they're insulting you. They're laughing at you because they love you. <laughs> they love that you are being appreciative with their culture and you know, the surroundings. So just keep in mind that you know, whenever you're heading in a different country, it's really good to practice the language. You know, a lot of people want to hear how you talk Vietnamese. You know, I've been trying to remind myself too. You know, every time I try to practice my you know, Vietnamese language to other people. They may not get it because of my accent. Maybe I'm like not doing it correctly. But it's just good. To, it's a feel good thing. Because you, know, you get to just know that you actually tried to speak in front of people and they really appreciate it. They are just give you open arms like, hey, you're willing to speak whatever you want to us because we really like how you appreciate our culture. So, yeah, um, definitely. So I hope I was able to give you enough information about myself and um, where I am currently at and what I'm doing right now. Um, but if I miss anything um, that I did not mention in this video, please let me know. Uh, I'll be happy to answer those questions directly uh, or whatever form of communication you would like to use. So with that, um, I can go straight to some questions that were submitted to me um, just a few weeks ago. So let's see. We have the first question here. It says, where do you stand on the current late 
laissez-faire position of many municipalities, including Ambler, about the ease with which people can demolish historically significant buildings. Oof, that's a long one. Um, so where do I stand on the issue, including Ambler? <coughs> well, I can say that I've been keeping updated. I've been keeping updated uh, <clears throat> on like what's going on in Ambler and the surrounding areas in terms of uh, all these historical, historically significant buildings. Um, you know, I honestly expected Ambler to be really supportive in all the historical structures that are standing as of today, um, but with the situation that I've been hearing and then what um, what happened with the Linda Rule Castle a couple years back, it, it just really shocked me. It really did. It just, um, I don't know. Um, but what I understand with you know how you know Ambler and like other places you know how their gov government and you know, council like how they work. I mean, in general, I, I understand that they want more people living in their area, and that's totally I totally get it. You know, right? Like if you want more people to come, you know, more businesses, more homes, right? I mean, that's gonna boost a lot of money, right? Um, but with historical structures, it's something that they don't really think too much about, right? Um, so like for Ambler, you know, like the first thing that pops out of our heads are like the Keys, you know, the Keysby Madison homes and buildings that, you know, are still standing today that truly plays a part in the Ambler community. Um, and you know, those were kept because it's part of our history. But for the others, right, the other historical buildings that are, that might be standing or might be hiding um, in sight in the, in the borough, um, they might be in jeopardy. Um, I'm just afraid that, you know, these are not as appreciative. Um, but going back to this question, I just, like in shock of what's going on in Ambler. You know, I grew up in Ambler all my life. And uh, it's just it's just insane that you know, Ambler is heading into that direction. You know, I was expecting Ambler to um, really, you know, be supportive in the history. You know, we have Main Street, right? Like I was expecting like they keep the, like all the historical stuff, all the historical stuff, you know, in, Know, in the borough, but it looks like, you know, Ambler's heading in the, that kind of direction where they want to, you know, modernize and like, renovate, revise, or revive, whatever. Um, but you know, I just felt like they, you know, just completely just switch, turn away from those historical buildings that should be more appreciative and, you know, I think what people don't know, right? People don't know that there might be some people, some couples, some families who might be interested in buying these homes. You know, these old homes that could be used to be, you know, reused. I'm just thinking that, you know, not only Ambler, but also in Whitpain Township and Logan Glennon. Just like, you know, has people ever thought about that? Why? Well, I don't know. But just, again, I'm just really shocked with like how Ambler is dealing with all you know that situation with you know the demolition of historical properties and just you know kind of changing the you know the historical content of the community. It's just just crazy. I'll just say that from there. Okay, so my next question I have here is, how do you go about selecting your topics, and how much time do you spend on each newsletter posting? Okay, well thank you so much for that question. 
So selecting my topics for my blog. So that, so in the beginning, I can just say in the beginning, I was just thinking a lot of random stuff. <laughs> just thinking like, um, okay, is there anything that relates to, does, or like, is there anything in the Wissahickon Valley region that, that connects to U.S. history or even world history? That's something that I've been thinking about throughout my blog from the beginning to this day. And, um, you know, I tried going online through Google. Google Books is actually one of the best resources that I have so far. And, uh, you know, sometimes it doesn't show up what I wanted, but it may lead to something else. It's always like that. You know, for example, if I look up something that um, is just, like, in my mind, I look that up, right? I look it up through Google, and then while looking through Google Books, there was a, a random content that I found that it doesn't even relate to what I want to search for, but it could lead to a next posting, right? So that pretty much, you know, uh, something that, like, how I came up with these topics is just like, oh, this is just out of the blue, like, okay, maybe I'll talk about that. But it depends on, like, if there's enough information on it, right? Like, if there's not enough, then, like, I have a choice to either just move on from it or maybe save it and then hopefully I can come back to it and just try again. So that's uh, something that I was doing. Um, I haven't, I try my best to work on these blogs um, during my free times, uh, even before coming here in Vietnam, uh, but <laughs> I have such a lazy mindset. I just like, you know, take a break and just pad my head somewhere on YouTube uh, or even jamming out with music in my earbuds. I always wear earbuds whenever I work on my blog, so um, yeah, it's just, you know, just random timing <laughs> that I do my blog, but I made sure that like, okay, when it's Thursday, it's Thursday. It has to be posted by Thursday. Like my blogs are scheduled like before that time, so I, I double check them to make sure that they are you know, all set. Make sure there's no mistakes in there, no typos. Um, but, but yeah, um, it's, it's a, it's, I would say it's a process, but it's like, you know, more flexible uh, for me to work on this. So, yeah. Um, and then in terms of uh, newsletters, I mean, newsletter, so like, okay, uh, my blog runs under Wix. So I, um, I do not sign up for like, uh, what do you call it? I do not sign up for like a dis subscription for it. I just, I was just been using it for free for like a long time. So I, so when I use it for free, that doesn't mean I, I can just post all these newsletters that I sent like many times. I can't really do that. There's a limit. So whenever I send a newsletter, I'm only allowed to send three. So I have to be careful at this point to um, like send like what kind of newsletters should I post, right? I can't like post everything, right? Only the blog itself. It can only post like every week because it's all right. It's a blog. But for newsletters, it's I'm only allowed to do three. But um, <coughs> newsletters at this point are things that... Um, only for something that I want everyone to listen to or everyone to read. I just want to make sure to inform my subscribers and followers like some important things they should um, should know about. So, um, but yeah, I like, I hope I answered all that question, all that for you. I know it's been pretty long, but um, it's just. Basically, my blog is just very flexible. It's really no boundaries that I have. It's just a matter of being careful, like how much, how much am I supposed to do it, and uh, you know, just trying to like stay on schedule here.
All right, so it looks like I got all the questions answered and um, I got all the questions that were submitted to me. But for those who um, haven't had the chance to ask me a question, you're always welcome to um, submit one to me uh, through email or through social media, whatever you use. I'll be happy to answer them to you directly. Um, but uh, other than that, I just want to say thank you all so much for tuning in. Uh, I really appreciate all of you so much for you know, following me and you know, being really appreciative of the history of our community at the Mistaken Valley region. Um, so with that, you know, I will make sure to continue blogging as much as I could uh, as I am in the middle of a busy, crazy school year at my international school in Vietnam. So good night, everyone, or should I say good morning, depending where you are. So I'll see you all next time.